Hi, everyone. Um, our guest for today is Vanessa Williams. Um, she is a senior fellow in governance studies at Brookings and a senior fellow at the Urban Brookings Tax Policy Center. She studies taxation, redistribution, and policy participation. She received her PhD in social policy from Harvard University. She is a member of the advisory board of the Institute of Responsive Gov Government. She received her PhD from social policy from Harvard University. The floor is yours, Vanessa. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, so I will go ahead and share my screen. And then I think I have to let's see here. Okay, does that work for you all? Can someone give me a thumbs up? Cool, okay. So I'm gonna to talk to you guys today about Texas and American democracy. And it's not the story you think. So, um, so sometimes sort of the, the popular conception of how taxes are seen in America is that they are something Americans really hate. So here we have the American Eagle crying because he's so sad about taxes. That's kind of the stereotype, I would say, about how taxes are understood. Uh, but that's wrong, it's a myth. Um, and part of that myth actually dates all the way back to something that happened in Boston. Some of you folks might remember this picture uh, or uh, have seen it before. It is a picture of the Boston Tea Party. Uh, and as you can see there, the, sort of the colonists there uh, dumping the tea into Boston Harbor. Um, and so famously, this is recalled as you know, this early example of how much Americans didn't wanna pay taxes. That story is untrue. Uh, the colonists were actually angry about a tax cut, um, a corporate tax cut, a kind of corporate welfare that was pro being provided by parliament uh, that wanted to bail out a company they saw as too big to fail, the East India Company. So what they did was give this one company special tax privileges, that is to say a tax cut, uh, along with a whole bunch of just straight funding um, to try and prop up a company that was looking like it was gonna go under. So, uh, you know, from this very beginning story, you can kind of see the, the, the way the taxes tend to get talked about in American history is not terribly accurate. Now, of course, uh, Americans were, oh, so here's a quote from Sam Adams, I should say. Um, this is, he organized uh, the um, Sons of um, the Sons of Liberty, who are the Patriot paramilitary organization that dumped the tea into the harbor. I don't need to tell people from Boston that. Um, and so here's what he had to say about the Tea Act, which was this, this tax cut. Um, he said it was introductive of um, monopolies, which beside the train of evils that attend them in a commercial view are forever dangerous to public liberty. Uh, that is to say, he thought that uh, corporate uh, tax breaks uh, endangered public liberty because they uh, made the government and corporations uh, too closely interlinked. Um, so of course, people in the colonies were angry about British taxation, but that didn't mean they were angry about taxation in principle. In fact, what they wanted was to tax themselves. So in the same way that eventually uh, American colonists wanted uh, the right to write their own laws, that didn't mean that they didn't like laws, they just didn't want parliament deciding them. So here are a couple of quotes that are demonstrating how people actually thought about taxation during this period. So this is the Virginia House of Burgesses. It's a petition they sent to parliament opposing um, the uh, uh, duties and taxes that uh, they wanted to implement, that parliament wanted to implement. So you can see they say taxation of the people by themselves or by persons chosen uh, by themselves to represent them is the distinguishing characteristic of British freedom. Uh, so taxation as the distinguishing characteristic of freedom is perhaps not how conservatives would describe it today, but it was how it was understood by the founders. Similarly, the, the New York General Assembly complaining about the same set of laws insisted that the grand right to tax ourselves could not be invaded by parliament. So, uh, so from the very beginning, sort of our understanding of tax history in America has been incorrect. Um, if people in New York thought that it was a grand right that we had to tax ourselves, who didn't like taxes? Uh, well, the answer to that is slaveholders. Um, so if you look at our constitution, you can see that taxation and protections for slavery are deeply interlinked, specifically that slaveholders put protections in the constitution to prevent abolition by taxation. They knew that even in a country where suffrage was limited to property to white men, most property to white men in the nation did not own slaves and most uh, property to white men, while not in, by, in no sense of the word abolitionist, understood that the slaveholder economy threatened the prosperity of small 
farmers. Uh, and so uh, slaveholders were worried about abolition by taxation and put a series of protections into the constitution, some of which we are still dealing with today. Uh, folks who've read ahead will see that this is the three-fifths clause, the infamous three-fifths clause. Uh, one thing that gets under noticed is that it's not just representation that was uh, uh, apportioned according to the three-fifths formula that counted uh, enslaved human beings as three-fifths of a person, uh, but also direct taxes. And what this meant in practice, it wasn't actually particularly well thought out by the Constitutional Convention. They didn't really think about the math very thoroughly here, it's quite clear. Um, but what it meant basically was that uh, you couldn't uh, you couldn't apply a direct tax. There's a tax understood at the time more or less as a tax directly on a person or a form of property. You couldn't apply that and not apportion it by state population. That meant, to, that, meant that large states would have a large tax bill whether or not they had a large amount of the taxed item. So that's a pretty crazy system, honestly. Um, and, but it basically meant that uh, forms of property that were held in one, primarily in one portion of the country, they're not exclusively, uh, like uh, enslaved people, uh, were difficult to tax. And slaveholders certainly understood this, uh, this provision in that way. There are two other tax limitations in the constitution. One reiterates the first one. It just says that a capitation or direct tax cannot be laid. That again, prevents taxation uh, on slavery outside of the uh, apportionment clause. And also there was a specific tax limitation on the, the uh, importation of enslaved people, something they avoid uh, expressing explicitly, uh, but was clearly about, about slavery, right? Not to exceed $10 for each person um, imported. So the first limits on taxation that exist in uh, under our you know, constitutional regime were explicitly about defending uh, the right of slaveholders to enslave people. Um, and that sort of um, uh, role of anti-tax politics as, a, as inimical, to bull, in, inimical to black freedom remains true throughout the rest of our history. So for example, if you see in the period uh, after the Civil War, uh, when uh, we see an end to slavery. Um, one of the first things, so this is a picture of the South Carolina legislature uh, in the, re at the, actually at the very end of the reconstruction period. Uh, this is the first time uh, we see black legislatures and legislators in the South. In South Carolina was a predominantly black slate and state and had a predominantly black legislature during this period. Um, and one of the primary things that the reconstruction legislatures were trying to do was raise taxes. Now, why were they trying to do that? Well, for a, a lot of different reasons. One, they wanted to be able to fund public education. The South had no functioning system of public education, uh, not just for uh, formerly enslaved people, who of course it was um, criminalized uh, to be literate, but even for poor white children, there was no system, serious system of public education across the South compared to the North. So one of the main jobs of the reconstruction governments was to try and create that public education system for both black and white children. And they were, in the brief period of time before Reconstruction, Reconstruction was overthrown by white supremacist violence, they were quite successful. So you see the literacy rate among Black males doubles within 10 years. Black women, for the first time, were more likely to be literate than Black men. And those rates were even higher where more Black politicians had served in office, sort of demonstrating the commitment uh, of freed people to public education as part of their uh, freedom. So um, public education was a big part of the need for taxation across the South. The other reason that people wanted to have uh, new taxes in the South was to try and redistribute wealth, right? All of the wealth that had been stolen from enslaved people had gone into the pockets of landholders, plantation owners, and those people were by and large still rich after the war and still owned all of the land. So um, the more radical uh, reconstruction uh, legislators wanted to, to take this on as well. Land reform was too radical for a lot of people, um, but they thought that maybe the tax system could be used to redistribute uh, the land that was held by former slaveholders. So here's a, a quote from North Carolina State Senator Abraham Galloway, who uh, was from North Carolina, self-emancipated to the North, came back as um, uh, to assist the Union Army in liberating uh, North Carolina, and then uh, served in the state Senate. He said, I want to see the man who owns one or two thousands of acres of land taxed at a dollar on the acre, and if they can't pay the taxes, sell their property, and then we Negroes can become landholders. 
So he is his dream, like uh, many other of the, among the more radical of the uh, Reconstruction legislators, was to use taxation as a way to right some amount of the wrong uh, that had been done to enslaved people in six, in previous generations. You see a similar quote here from Matthew Gaines. He was a state senator in Texas. He was also a person who had been enslaved there until the war and had repeatedly uh, attempted to self-emancipate. He said, if there is any virtue in taxation, we will tax them until we tax them out of their lands. So taxation was central to the project of reconstruction. It was central to the project of trying to achieve some form of reparation uh, in the immediate post-war period. Um, but sadly, taxation was also central to the organization of white supremacy to overthrow the multiracial governments uh, of reconstruction. This is a, a, a poster from the period that was, it showed some of the radical members of the South uh, Carolina legislature. And um, if you read the text below, you can see that it talks about the racial breakdown of the South Carolina legislature, but also specifically makes the point that um, very few people who were serving in the legislature at the time were quote unquote taxpayers. That of course is because they were newly freed people. Uh, they Well, first of all, they did pay taxes because they were poll taxes, any kind of other taxes, but many of them did not own property because their property had been in their labor had been stolen from them. But it's treated here as evidence of a uh, lack of respectability among the legislators of South Carolina. And so um, uh, as white supremacists attempt to uh, retake power across the South, they find that the idea of tax paying is a very useful framework uh, to try and disguise the precise outlines of, um, of their mission. Uh, you know, as W.B. Du Bois says, the, the, the real critique of reconstruction governments was that it was poor men ruling rich men. Um, but that was impolitic to say, so they used this taxpayer rhetoric to try and disguise that. So uh, Trayvon Logan, who is an economist, uh, has done some very important work looking at the relationship specifically between uh, taxation and the violent response to reconstruction. He finds that the chances that a black politician was violently attacked uh, during the reconstruction period increased by 3% for every additional dollar per capita tax revenue collected. So there's a very close relationship between uh, where taxes were higher and where white supremacist violence was higher. Um, so what, how did tax paying have this role? How did this taxpayer rhetoric allow for the, the reconstruction of white supremacy, the overthrow of multiracial democracy in the South? In two ways. One, um, wealthy uh, white plantation owners found that talking about taxation helped them uh, peel off the votes of poorer whites who were paying higher taxes in this period. So you imagine you're a poor white person in the upcountry of one of the Southern states, you have a basically a subsistence farm. Well, the reconstruction governments have, have had to raise your taxes to fund the school system and simply because the economy was in crisis um, and those taxes were hard to pay. And um, what uh, the sort of plantation elite found is that straightforward appeals to racism were not particularly successful in the first elections after, um, uh, the end of the Civil War during the sort of period of radical reconstruction, um, straightforward appeals to racism were less successful than they had expected. Any number of countries whites were hated the plantation elite, knew full well that um, under the plantation elite they had um, you know, seen, for example, no public schools for their children. Um, but the tax paying argument was more successful um, in building alliances, cross-class alliances among white people. The other thing that the sort of taxpayer rhetoric did very effectively was make um, what was what should have been patently obviously basically a return of the Confederacy across the South look more respectable to Northerners. So right, so Northern industrial elites were during this time experiencing the beginnings of sort of worker organizing in the cities, uh, sort of an influx of immigrants who were bringing with them ideas about class struggle, about workers' rights, about unionism. Uh, that were terrifying to the industrialists of cities like New York and Boston. And so um, the idea that uh, taxpayers, wealthy taxpayers needed to be protected from the rabble was something that was terribly appealing. And you see the um, sort of Confederate elite reorganize under this taxpayer rhetoric because in part because it is so appealing to the Northerners who they have to placate if they are going to retake control of the Southern states. The picture here is a man named um, Martin Witherspoon Gary. He was a Confederate general in South Carolina. He was absolutely unreconstructed. He uh, left Appomattox rather than uh, admit defeat. He um, organized uh, in 1876 a campaign of 
excruciating violence across South Carolina that um, included the murder of black voters and black uh, elected officials, uh, um, threats of violence, actual violence, and they helped turn the tide uh, in South Carolina uh, and prevent free and fair elections in the state that it was the beginning of the retaking of white supremacist control. Um, so he's uh, helped organize those um, that paramilitary white supremacist violence, he helped organize the red shirts, but he was also uh, leading member of the Taxpayers Convention of South Carolina, which was terribly well regarded in the North as this very serious and respectable body. Um, and so he, in a sense, managed to disguise his real project uh, of uh, reclaiming control for the plantation elite that had ruled before the war by reframing it as this nominally colorblind uh, project about taxation. Okay. Um, so what do we see once we return the rule of the taxpayers as uh, any number of the Jim Crow governments describe themselves? What do we see in that period? We see a couple of different things. We see um, property tax caps for the first time, that is to say limits on property tax increases. Again, you in Massachusetts will know about this. Uh, you have super majority requirements to raise taxes or to raise revenue or to increase the size of budgets. So a super majority requirement is basically um, minoritarian control, right, it's an anti-democratic policy. Um, so those get put in place across the South. We see, of course, it uh, low tax states are never actually low tax for everyone. What it typically means when a state is low tax, it means that they have a very regressive tax system that is high for the poor. So when you, when you limit property taxes, revenue has to come from somewhere else. They come from more regressive taxes. They also come from the, uh, new fees and fines. This helps build a convict leasing system across the South, which uh, has more than a few echoes in our contemporary system of mass incarceration. It was also, of course, fees and fines were applied in a discriminatory fashion to, um, to uh, undercut black communities, to undercut black economic independence, and to provide basically a supply of convict labor to um, the industrial industries across, um, to the industries across the South. Of course, the most famous part of the tax regime of the Jim Crow era was the poll taxes. You can see a picture there of someone's receipt for having paid their poll taxes. Um, poll taxes preceded the Jim Crow period um, because they were very too, I mean, they're ancient, an ancient tax that existed since ancient times, but the innovation of the Jim Crow period was making those taxes voluntary to pay. Um, and also linking them to one's right, uh, conclusively to one's right to vote. That is to say, you set a poll tax at the, at the level of a uh, working person's entire day of wages. Uh, you say that they don't have to pay the tax, but they have to pay the tax to vote. This is part of a larger system of uh, voter suppression uh, that goes into place during the Jim Crow period. So this is what rule of the taxpayers looks like uh, between the consolidation of the Jim Crow era and uh, the civil rights movement. Now, I think uh, already for you guys, I'm sure this will have felt quite familiar for those who have followed contemporary politics, but I think it's worth pointing out that after the second reconstruction, another way of thinking of the civil rights era, you see a new anti-tax fervor that has more than a little bit of similarities with the last one uh, that instituted the Jim Crow era, right? So this is true, of course, in Massachusetts, you have Proposition two and a half. It is true in California where there's a tax revolt that limits property taxes there. Um, and it's true also in the, in the rhetoric of campaigners like Reagan who bring up, uh, you know, somewhat mythological, frankly, uh, ideas of the welfare queen uh, that are always, when he talks about the welfare queen who's receiving all of these benefits unfairly, um, are almost always compared to the nominal hardworking taxpayer who is, of course, coded as white compared to the um, sort of dog whistle of the welfare queen. So in post-civil rights, we see this new anti-tax fervor take hold. And to a substantial degree, I think we still are living in that uh, political era. I mean, you can see it go right through, for example, Mitt Romney's uh, language of the 47% who don't pay income taxes and therefore don't care for their own lives and don't deserve his attention as president of the United States. And of course, I think it resonates with the sort of Tea Party rhetoric and um, all the way through our contemporary moment. So the interesting thing about the last 40 years, and this is going to be my last point, and then I will um, wrap it up. The, uh, the interesting thing about this 40 years, my whole lifetime of anti-tax rhetoric 
that starts in the late 70s and early 80s as part of the backlash to the civil rights movement is that certain parts of tax attitudes have been basically unfazed by it. And I think this is a small place for optimism. So if you ask uh, Americans whether corporations and upper income people are paying too much or too little in taxes, they have very consistently and for a very long time felt that upper income people and corporations should be paying more. There's a strong commitment to progressive taxation in this country that is unfazed uh, by anti-tax rhetoric. Uh, similarly, if you know, you can see here, this is actually the issue that bothers people most about the tax system is the feeling that some corporations don't pay their fair share, and that some wealthy people don't pay their fair share. And finally, you know, if you want to look particularly at Republicans on this issue, this is uh, a little bit of a complicated chart to read, so I'll walk you guys through it. Um, this is a chart showing what happens if you talk to people about what the estate tax is. Now, the estate tax is a tax uh, paid on estates at death. Uh, it applies only to very wealthy people having many, many millions of dollars at the time of their death. Um, so what happens when you tell people who, um, who pays, right? Now, on the left, you see Democrats and independents. They already, the probability of supporting it, one would be everyone supporting it, zero is no one supports it, as you can see. Um, uh, Democrats already support uh, the idea of an estate tax, and so do independents. So you, it's above 50, the 0.5 mark, so about half of people support it. On the bottom, you're seeing low, medium, and high. That's their income level. So low-income Democrats, medium-income Democrats, and high-income Democrats all like the estate tax. Now let's look at the right side of the graph here. We have Republicans divided again into low-income Republicans, medium-income Republicans, and high-income Republicans. The gray line is what people's attitudes are when you just ask them about the estate tax. And as you can see, Republicans do not like the estate tax, right? Not low-income Republicans, not medium-income Republicans, not high-income Republicans. The black line on the right side shows what happens if you tell them who pays it. That is to say, that is people with many millions of dollars. The red arrow shows you the change. That is to say, if you tell low-income Republicans that the estate tax applies to very rich people, they go from not supporting it to supporting it. There is a lot of room uh, for support there's a big class divide in the Republican party on progressive taxation. And you can see here that just giving people very basic information about who pays progressive taxes makes those taxes popular. All right, so I'm gonna wrap up here and just sort of summarize very quickly. Um, the first thing I'd want you folks to take away from this is that when you hear anti-tax rhetoric, you should remember that it is and has always been the rhetoric of democracy's opponents. It is not a coincidence that the party that supports tax breaks for the rich is the party that supports voter suppression. That is, in fact, the standard situation in American history. Um, the anti-tax rhetoric has flourished, not always, but always in periods of reaction to the expansion of suffrage to Black people. Um, that is why you see anti-tax rhetoric and taxpayers in the period of the overthrow of our first effort in multiracial democracy, it is why you see anti-tax rhetoric and references to white people as taxpayers in the second period of reaction to our second effort in multiracial democracy in America. The piece of hope I would leave you with on this front is that despite decades of conservative dominance on the issue of taxation in our contemporary time, most Americans' anger about the tax system is that rich people are not paying enough. All right. So I'll just say thank you guys very much. I hope that was interesting to you folks. Um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions you have um, about my work more generally or this work in particular. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, fascinating. So for me, at least, fascinating from the from the very first uh, slide, as you said, that, that first story that we get. Um, yeah, just just truly fascinating. Can you just say that just one more time? Just that that very first. Just... Oh, about the Boston Tea Party. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, I mean, if you remember the Tea Party, that was a reaction to Barack Obama's presidency. Uh, you might think that the Tea Party, the historical Tea Party, the Boston Tea Party, uh, was a reaction to you know um, was co colonists not wanting to pay taxes. It was not a reaction to colonists wanting, not wanting to pay taxes. It was colonists' anger at a tax cut for a British corporation, the, English, the um, East India Company, uh, that was a very big corporation that Parliament wanted to prop up and keep from going under. That is, a corporation deemed too big to fail. They gave that corporation a big old tax cut, which actually made tea cheaper uh, in uh, the United or in the American colonies. But uh, the colonists in Boston knew that a special tax break for one corporation encouraged monopolies. 
um, or undercut smuggling, depending how you, depending how you think about it. Um, but they didn't. The Boston Tea Party was an event that was uh, a protest against a tax break for corporations. It was not a protest against high taxes. Wow, that tr that truly is fascinating. No, thank you. Um, of course. Yeah, and and I guess I just found myself. You did talk about um, one person who's talked about this some more. I think you said Trayvon Long. Um, Logan. Yeah. Logan, thank you. Yeah. Just are there any um, you know additional text uh, that you would recommend just to just to read about this uh, further? And I'm sure you have some writings of your own. As well. Yeah, absolutely. And I can, um, let me see, I, I wonder if I'm capable of putting uh, a couple, like a couple of things in the chat I made. This may test my um, technological abilities. But the um, uh, the short answer is that Trayvon Logan has written a number of very good economics papers. He's an economist. I think he is at um, Ohio State University, if I'm remembering that right. Um, and he's written a number of texts looking both at the reconstruction period and at other periods. I think you would find almost all of his work. So let me put that, his name. Great. Uh, and I think it's Trayvon spelled like that off the top of my head. I think that's right. That's um, yeah. And um, then here I'll just quickly add a couple of things that I've written that might be interesting. This is a piece for dissent about radical taxation which talks a little bit about how um, I think we should think about taxation, um, particularly in light of climate change. And then this uh, is an article that goes into a little more detail about that, that very horrid man, um, General Gary and, and his, uh, his taxpayers and precisely what they did uh, in South Carolina in 1876. So, and those are, I guess, would be the sort of additional readings I'd recommend. Um, if you guys, I don't want to take you guys over seven o'clock, but if you have other questions for me, I'm more than happy to answer them. Sure. And I was just gonna, I was just gonna ask, uh, yeah, if you, if you didn't didn't mind, and this this could be the last question, um, I have this uh, radical taxation article open, but yeah, if you could just uh, maybe just give us a little bit of a preview of what's in there, what you talk about. Um, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, so the radical taxation article um, sort of uh, asks the question, uh, why do conservatives so dislike taxes, right? Now, one reason you could say, and I would certainly agree, is that um, taxation has the capacity to be redistributed, right? So you have high taxes on the rich, people don't want to pay taxes, so they don't like taxation because of that risk. But I think that, and that's that's basically right, and it's one of the reasons why you see that when the scope of the public is um, up for debate, that is to say, in the United States, when we've been considering uh, extending the vote to Black people, uh, suddenly taxation is this very controversial issue, right? Because it opens up this prospect of democratic taxation, uh, as long as democrat the power to tax is in the hand of the elites, it's not particularly frightening to wealthy people. But if it's in the in the hands of a larger group of people, it is frightening to them. Um, so. On the one hand, I think the reason the taxation is troubling to conservatives is because it has this redistributive potential. But the other thing that taxation that makes taxation unique, because taxes are by far, I mean, they're not the most redistributive kinds of policy making we can do. We can we redistribute uh, wealth all the time through government without using taxes. Uh, you know, every form of property law changes, uh, you know, the redistribution of wealth, you just have to imagine something like the legalization of marijuana, for example, as an example of switching something uh, into a, a legitimate business and, and shifting, you know, millions, potentially billions of dollars, right? Um, so there are all kinds of policies that are redistributive. Why is taxation so often the particular concern of conservatives? And the argument I make in the piece is that it's because the tax it's because taxes uh, are applied to private property, and not they aren't just applied to private property. So are fees and fines. But the thing about taxation is that it suggests that it is normal and legitimate, and frankly, completely ordinary for the government and in uh, a democracy, the people to lay claim to private property for public purposes. And that is the really fundamentally radical thing about taxation. It's the idea that even um, that private property can be can be made public, that it can be used for public purposes, and that at the end of the day, the um, the primacy of the public is a very ordinary part of government. And so I think that's troubling to conservatives. And I think it's also something <clears throat> that we need to take seriously if we're going to combat climate change, because um, 
I think that if we're going to make the kinds of economy-wide changes that need to occur uh, in a very short period of time to hold off, stave off the very worst of climate change, uh, we need to recognize that the public interest, the common good comes first. And that is what, at the end of the day, taxes remind us is true. So that's what the article's about. Um, I hope you'll find it interesting. I really enjoyed writing it. And thank you guys so much for having me um, at your meeting. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate it. And uh, with that, we will say goodbye. And we will uh, turn off, we'll stop the recording. Thank you.